Good morning, everybody. My name is Paula White, and I am the instructional um, recording lecturer this uh, mod for uh, Accounting 102, and this is week three. So congratulations for getting this far in week three, and also congratulations for completing Accounting 102. You all have come such a long way from, what, a mere seven weeks ago. So congratulations to everyone there. Um, I do want to let you know what we're going to be doing today, if I can advance the, yeah. Okay, so today's agenda, I'm going to go over once again the resources and help uh, that you have access to. Um, uh, many times I get texts from students um, really frantically needing some help, and I don't think they really understand that they have a lot of lifelines. They just don't have one lifeline. So um, we're going to go over that. We're going to have the Chapter 8 instructional lecture. And just like last week, I'm going to go over Week 3 homework, what it is, what is expected, and kind of how do I get started. So um, if there's any other... Um, uh, requirements for today's agenda. We do have a couple folks on this lecture today, and I've asked them to unmute themselves whenever they have questions and just pop in, because if there's a question at that moment uh, with whoever's on the line, I bet you 25% and more of the folks listening to this uh, lecture will have the same question. So you're speaking for the entire cohort. No pressure, but <laughs> uh, what your questions are would be the same questions as everyone else. And yes, one question you might have in mind is, I do know how to spell instructional instead of instructional. Okay. <laughs> so let's get started with, let me get to the system. Okay, so I'm confused. Where do I get help? I don't know where to turn. I'm lonely. I, I'm totally lost. So what do you do? You sign on to your class. And then first off, you go to Live Session. You click on Live Session. Click here for Schedule. And you wait for seeheinstructure.com. And then you get a cup of coffee. Come on. Cooperate. There we go. So this is your live session schedule. And I know you can read English as well as I do, but basically the first one, is the instructional lecture, which is the one I am scheduled for for this mod. Then you have these other uh, time slots that the other instructors who are also teaching Accounting 102 are hosting, but they're not lecturing. They're not speaking to you like I'm speaking to you. They're sitting there waiting for you to call in and, and ask your questions. They are there as a support system. And they know their stuff. They are very good. And pretty much, maybe with maybe 2% of the words being different, what they say and how they say it will be pretty much exactly how your instructor will say it and express it. And sometimes it might be helpful to hear some other person speak it instead of your exact instructor. So don't worry about when my instructor is hosting one of these live sessions because we're all there to help all the students and we're all quality. So I do suggest that you keep these times down because each mod they do change. So this mod they happen to be tonight at 8 p.m. tomorrow morning. Oh, tomorrow at 8 p.m. 
uh, Wednesday at 6 and Friday at 9 a.m. And Saturday, the day that all homework seems to be done, is uh, Saturday at 11. So that's an open lab. Ask your questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Now, um, to remind you also, I'm going to go home here. That does not replace the wonderful services you get from Shark and the student support service folk. I'm going to click on the Shark and the top section right here, the third uh, column, Student Success Center. I'm clicking on that. And uh, first time here, click on instructions, click. But if you go to accounting, click on that. And this is the this, this schedule, very easy to find. This is the schedule of when the live uh, tutors are available. And these tutors do know accounting. That's why this is when they're scheduled for uh, helping you. So you can see there's a lot of hours. I mean, my gosh, tomorrow is from 10 a.m. to 11 p.m. That's 13 hours of support. Uh, Wednesday is 13 hours. Thursday is 12 hours. We have, it looks like 14 hours of support on Friday and four hours of support on Saturday. So between your schedule, your work schedule, your life, there should be some time within those 12 to 14 hour days plus the faculty supporting you that you could possibly get some live help. Um, also, not to be um, overshadowed, but you have some awesome resources. And I'm going to go to modules here. So on, in Course Home, of course you have your textbook. Yeah, yeah, you always hear that from your faculty. Have you read your textbook? Well, the textbook's pretty awesome. So they're located in the Vital Source ebook uh, section. Plus, there are these mega course lecture videos. The course uh, format that you are in in Accounting 101 and 102 are called mega courses. Uh, because I think you have mega support from all the faculty. That's my interpretation of that. So I'm going to click on to here. And there are usually five videos. Yes. One on how an introduction on to what a mega course is all about. But you've been in, this is your second one. So you know you're an expert with that. Here's the uh, video for week one on closing entries. Here's week two on sales journals, week three on purchases journals, and week four will be all about handling cash, cash receipts as well as cash expenditures. These are at most 10 to 15 minute videos that are very instructional in nature. They don't sound like the textbook and they're very personable. They're very approachable and understandable. So I think with all of this, uh, the hour lecture that is just like all the other courses recorded and uploaded by your instructor into the uh, uh, announcements, you have these videos that are available to you 24-7. You have your uh, student support service folks, the tutors, that are available to you pretty much 12, 12, to 12, 12 to 14 hours a day. Um, and then you have the uh, faculty who's teaching this hosting one hour long sessions just to, to get your questions and to support you from that aspect. So if there's any other way we can support you all, uh, please let us know and we will forward it on to administration. But that's a lot of support and that's pretty awesome for the college that you are attending your curriculum through. I haven't seen this much support in other places. So I think that's pretty awesome. So let's go back to the PowerPoint to tell us what we're doing today. And the next thing is, well, first, are there any, from the people who are on the line, are there any questions?
questions about how to get help or the resources. Are you all good on that? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, great. I was hoping silence was golden. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Um, so let's go to the actual instructional lecture. And let me find them. Um, remember, week one was on closing entries, which was to uh, set up your general ledger to be prepared for the next year of activity. Last week was on the sales journal. This week is on the purchases journal. So you're going to feel some similarities to it, but on the, the other side. Uh, slideshow. Okay, here we go. I have no idea where that bridge is. So accounting for purchases and accounts payable. Remember last week it was sales, merchandise sales, and accounts receivable. This is when we're making purchases. Some other company has a sale from us. We are now purchasing from someone else, and we have to pay someone else. So this is the flip side of last week. But every business has to actually make purchases, especially if you're a merchandising business, because Walmart has to purchase their product in order to sell it to you. They do not have a huge uh, manufacturing facility. Uh, a lot of the things that they sell are name brands, so they have to purchase it from a vendor. So this is what they have to do as well as a mom-and-pop store down the street from your local uh, corner store in your area. Uh, so merchandise purchases. We're going to uh, do recording of the purchases of merchandise on credit, and that's going to be done in a three-column purchases journal. And we're going to post uh, from that journal to the uh, general Oh, I'm sorry. We're going to post to the general ledger from this purchases journal. So this should look a little familiar. Well, not yet. Uh, so let's just paint a picture. The sales department sends an authorized purchase requisition to the purchasing department. This is basically saying we are low on a certain inventory we need to have more inventory in order to sell so we need more inventory so this is that purchase requisition that the sales department sends to the purchasing department and the purchasing department issues an authorized purchase order and sends it to the selected supplier what would happen if this control was not in place and the sales department could purchase their inventory whenever they needed to purchase it. Have any idea what would happen? Someone could order um, supply that wasn't needed or over order supplies. Exactly. You could order uh, a gross of uh, cases of water and I knew that we needed to order water so I ordered them so now we have two gross of cases of water and we're oversupplied on water now right right and where would you order where would you place your order would you place it exactly the same place I would place my order Probably not. Right. You would go to Walmart to order your water, and I would go to Office Depot, let's say, and order my water. Uh, but there might be a pricing difference. And we're going to learn a little bit later that when we, sell, when we buy a lot from one vendor, a lot of times we can get a discount, a quantity discount. So we're kind of playing against each other by not keeping the 
uh, process streamlined. Because I'd rather order from one central place and get be able to, for the company to get a lower price for it. It's the same water. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Great. Well, thank you. So um, the purchasing department issues the authorized purchase order and sends it to the selected supplier, not because they're control freaks, but because of controlling and making sure that we don't do not double order or order from someone who uh, whose price is higher and somehow plays against our getting a higher percentage of a discount. After we issue the purchase order, then the merchandise gets shipped to us. So we get a receiving report from our uh, vendor, and that's prepared when the merchandise is received. So now we have pallets being delivered in our loading dock. We have it, and we have a receiving report that says so many cases of water has been received, Check and the receiving folks in our at our loading dock makes check marks going, yeah, we have three boxes there, we have two boxes here. And they at that point would make a notation if one box was missing. Then the accounting department gets involved because they receive the invoice from the from the vendor for payment and they get copies of the purchase order from the purchasing department who made the purchase and then they get this receiving report. So they get the information from the vendor, how much money they want to receive from us. Then we compare that to the uh, purchase order that we actually ordered. Sometimes that's different. And sometimes, and then how much did we receive? Because sometimes we receive more product by mistake, but a lot of times the order is exactly 100% perfect, but sometimes they didn't have enough merchandise to ship to us at that time. So it was a short order because other uh, some of the product is on back order. Have you ever heard the term back order? Yes, I have. Good. And that just means you don't get the you don't get the product yet because it's on back order. Yeah, and they usually tell you about when to expect it. Exactly. So you wouldn't pay the entire, on the on the purchase order, you wouldn't pay all the stuff that you ordered because you didn't get it yet. Because at this point, you would only pay what you received. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, just like when you make an, an order from JCPenney or L.L. Bean or Walmart.com for Christmas, they're not going to charge you and you're not going to pay for things that they have on back order. You're only going to pay for things that they ship immediately or at the time of shipment, that's when they charge you. Same thing happens with business. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so let's look at a cost of goods sold. It's an expense account, but first it has to go into a purchases type of account. So cost of goods sold, uh, first thing off, we have the amount of, uh, the, the value of items that we actually purchased from our vendor. So in this case, we purchased $550 from the vendor. So we're going to debit purchases. And then we're going to add to that any cost that we have to incur for freight. So any cost that we incur for freight, give me a second, okay. Any cost that we incur for freight, in this case it's $50. Uh, we have to add to the value of of the inventory that we receive because it costs us five fifty, but we also had to pay fifty dollars to get it into our loading dock so we can sell it. So now we owe the company, our vendor, five hundred and fifty plus fifty. We owe through an accounts payable account six hundred dollars. 
So this becomes our journal entry. 550 to purchases. Freight in is 50. And accounts payable is a credit of 600. So we owe the vendor $600. And accounts payable being a credit should make sense because in Accounting 101, we said any account that ends with the word payable is a liability. And liability accounts have a normal balance of a credit. So to increase a liability, you would credit the liability account. So we're going to credit the liability account by 600. And then we have to debit purchases and freight in. And here it says that the cost of goods sold accounts have normal debit balances. And that makes sense because you have to have debits equal credits. Has that ever changed yet in your academic career in accounting? Debits are always having to equal credits. Okay, so if we make four purchases in a month, that means we have to post to the general ledger 12 times. That's a lot of work. Uh, but what happens if we actually make purchases, oh, 40 times, 40 different purchases in a month? That would be 120 different postings to the general ledger account. It gets ridiculous because all we could be doing all day long would be posting to the general ledger account. So, and we'd be doing the same journal entry. Purchases debit, debit freight in, credit accounts payable. Debit purchases, debit purchases, debit purchases. Freight in is next as a debit in each one of these and then credit accounts payable. It's the same accounts in the general ledger. We're just having different purchases because different numbers, different amounts, and different dates. And therefore different uh, actual invoices of different transactions, but it's the same posting. So I'm a little bit lazier than that, and I think most people are. So if there's a shortcut to be had that would get us the same level of confidence in our financial statements and the same level of detail that's really required, we're going to be using a purchases journal. Remember last week we had a uh, accounts receivable journal or a sales journal? We had a sales journal last week recording all the sales transactions that we had. But well, this week we're doing a purchases journal. So uh, we looks like we made six purchases throughout the month of January. And we're going to, just like I uh, showed you in the previous slide, we're going to debit purchases. We're going to debit freight in. And we're going to credit accounts payable so that when we add up these uh, six transactions throughout the month we're going to post them to the actual accounts payable account the purchases account and the freight in account and let's get all these little arrows up to see what they want to tell us okay so to purchase from the I'm sorry to post to the general ledger from the purchases journal, the first step would be taking the page number. I'm sorry. The page number goes to P1. For purchases journal, P1. And here's P1 and here's P1. So this one really goes to P1. The date is at the end of the month because it's the entire months of transactions. Because we're posting to accounts payable the total of eighteen thousand seven ninety five, so we're posting eighteen thousand seven ninety five to accounts payable because that's the direction that we are given from the heading accounts payable credit. 
So accrediting accounts payable 18795, putting it here in the accounts payable general ledger account. Then we're going to be taking all of these arrows are off. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to undo these arrows. Then we're going to take the 205 from the accounts payable general ledger account, this 205, and we're going to write it underneath the 18,795. So we have everything done. We have uh, the 31st being pulled from the purchases journal. We have P for purchases, page one for the posting reference in the accounts payable general ledger. We have the total for the month being credited to the accounts payable account. And then we take the account number 205 and write it underneath the total that we posted to the accounts payable general ledger 205 and we put it in parentheses. Now we're going to do the same thing to the next two columns. Purchases debit. We're going to go to purchases. We're going to debit that account by the total 17,540. 17,540 is the purchases journal, so it's going to be a P for purchases. Page one, so that's the posting reference in the purchases journal. Then we're going to take the account number 501 and put it underneath the subtotal of the purchases transactions that we posted. We posted 17,540, so right below it we're going to put account 501. So that column has been taken care of. And guess what? We're going to do this exact same thing with the freight in debit account. Uh, the date, January 31st, P1 for purchases journal, page 1. We're going to debit the total, 1255. We're going to pick off the account number for that general ledger account and write it underneath the total that we posted to it, uh, account 502. So does this slide make sense to the folks that are on right now? Yes. Yes, it does. Great. Does it kind of feel similar to last week? Yes. That makes it's it very easier to understand. Last week. <laughs> what? Makes it easier to understand from last week. <laughs> yeah, you did most of the learning last week last week as to why we're trying to save you some work and this week it's the same thing except it's a purchases journal I don't know about you but if I have a lot of things to post manually to a general ledger I'm human so sometimes I write down the wrong numbers and then nothing works because everything is not in balance my debits no longer equal my credits and I have a big mess I'm sure that doesn't happen to you but <laughs> this helps. <laughs> I'm sure this helps. Uh, if you minimize the level of detail that you have to post, it minimizes your chance for human error. And it makes it easier to find the error, too. Exactly, because you have less things to look for. Perfect. Okay, so let's move on. Thank you for participating on the call today. It's so much better to talk to someone. <laughs> Yes, all these mismatched arrows. <laughs> okay, so now um, Okay, so now we're actually talking about recording transactions in the purchases journal to begin with. That assumes that this is blank and we have to start from scratch or we have to continue on with current month. So that's where we're going with this slide. So first thing you do on the purchases journal is to write down the date, the supplier's name, the invoice from that supplier because they want you to pay them a certain amount, 
the date of the invoice and terms. We're going to talk about terms in the next slide or two. And then when we post to the actual uh, Active Designs Accounts Payable Ledger, Specialized Accounts Payable Ledger, that's when we check box, check this box, because we will have then just posted this detail into the account for Active Designs Accounts Payable. And we'll get to that in a moment. Um, yeah, because purchases don't, this is all the detail that you have to do for purchases and all the detail they had to do for freight. But who owes, who do we owe money to? We put $18,000 into accounts payable. So remember last week we had an accounts receivable subsidiary ledger where we kept track of everyone who owes us money we're having the same thing this week with keeping track with everyone we owe money to oh that's that's good okay come on Okay, well, we'll get there. Um, and I will show you your actual. So remember last week you had the um, an account. It was called Accounts Receivable Ledger, where every account on the Accounts Receivable Ledger was every one of your customers you extended credit to. Well, this, this subject, you're going to have an Accounts Payable Subsidiary Ledger. And it was going to have everyone who extended credit to you and that you owe money to. So Active Designs will have 2865 credited to that accounts payable subsidiary ledger account called, called um, Active Designs. But we're going to see that, and I, I can guarantee you we'll see that when I go over the homework, what's expected and, and how it's going to look for you all. Um, so example of credit terms. So you buy something and you're the company and you purchased it from a, a, a new vendor for you and the terms are called net 30. So you pay us within 30 days. And you're kind of happy with that because you don't have to pay the money now. Because, you know, when I go to Walmart and Costco and any store, usually at the retail level, I cannot walk out of their store without having paid them. Because I either have to pay them with my debit card, my credit card, or cash, or a check. They want cash before, they want to be paid before you walk out with all their merchandise. But when it's business to business, uh, quite often they extend each other credit. So it's okay if you, okay, I'll sell you um, those office supplies now and I'll send you an invoice and you pay me within 30 days. So the credit terms here would be net 30 days or it would be also uh, written as in diagonal 30 which means payment is due 30 days after you receive the invoice. And that's kind of cool because a lot of times you, um, you, when you buy, okay, so you don't have to pay for 30 days, but that company doesn't have, the company sold to you and they expect you to pay within 30 days because they have vendors that they have to pay usually within 30 days or less. So the cash has to keep going around from business to business for business to continue and the economy continues to thrive. Uh, you could get a, uh, a term called 10 days EOM, which stands for end of month. So net 10 days, so you have to pay the total amount due in 10 days after the end of the month. 
So if you purchase uh, the material or the uh, if you made the purchase transaction on the 25th of the month, when is this amount due? So if, if it uh, says uh, net 10 days at the end of the month, um, and it's 30 days in the month, so you have uh, 10 days into the next month to pay it. Exactly. So it's due on the tenth of in this in this month. This is August. So if we paid it if we bought it today, which I think is the twenty fourth. Today is August twenty fourth. So we purchased it today. We needed to pay for this on the tenth of September, which is only seventeen days from now. However, if we had purchased it on August 1st, when would it be due? It would still be due um, September 10th. Exactly. So you'd have it, you'd have uh, free credit or free use of the other person's money for the 31 days in August plus 10 days in September. So you'd have a 41 day use of their money. Where if you bought it in Feb on the 24th, you'd only have seven days remaining in August plus 10 days in September. So 41 days of free credit versus 17. I'd rather go 41, wouldn't you? Yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So it's, I don't see that. I, in fact, I've never quite seen the net 10 days EOM in my work as a CPA in industry. But I do know it's out there. Uh, but it's just something to think through. You have to really be critically thinking when you see these terms. So if you see intent EOM is net 10 days after the end of the month. So if you bought it on the 30th of the month, you only have 10 days to pay it. If you buy it the next day on the 1st of the month, you have 40 days to pay it. I'd rather buy things on the first of the month with those credit terms. Now what is very common, and I've seen this a lot, is 210 net 30, which is uh, 2 diagonal 10 comma n diagonal 30. This means if you pay within 10 days of receiving the invoice, you're going to get just pay us 98% of the amount due. Else, if you can't pay us in 10 days, pay us the entire amount, the net amount, in 30 days. So if you buy it on the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 28th, 29th, or 30th, it doesn't matter. When you receive the invoice, the date on that invoice, if you pay within 10 days of that date, you get 2% off. So just pay 98% of the amount due. If you can't make that payment date, then pay 100% 30 days from the invoice date. Now, I have seen this to be 1%, 110 net 30. I've seen 1.5, net 30. So the percentage can be changed, but the discount 10 net 30 is very common. And that's three of the main uh, examples of credit terms. But in real industry, I've seen the first and third quite a lot. I've never seen this, the center one. But there should be some specialized industries that that is um, important in. Maybe some uh, manufacturing industries because it's important to know how, much, how many sales you have at the beginning of the month because that encourages people to make their sales or their purchases from you at the very beginning of the month because it helps your business cycle better. So I would imagine that would be more appropriate for uh, production type companies. 
So uh, this is just a summary of the purchases journal because it simplifies the posting process. And the proof of the purchases journal, your debit column for purchases debit column on that purchases journal was seventeen thousand five forty. The freight in debit column totaled twelve fifty five, which totals eighteen thousand seven ninety five, and that should be the same amount as the accounts payable credit column on that same journal of seventeen thousand. 18,795. What they're saying there is simply here that this debit column of 17,540 plus this debit column of 1255, the sum of these two numbers have to equal this number because debits have to equal credits and these two debits for each line has to equal the credit for that line or else you have an arithmetic error and you have to find it and correct it because you're posting the totals and the totals have to also stay in the rules of debits equal credits. Yay, debits equal credits. So there are seven steps post from the purchases journal to the general ledger. First you locate the accounts payable ledger account, enter the date, enter the posting reference, enter the amount from the accounts payable credit column in the purchases journal in the credit column of the accounts payable ledger account. Uh, compute the new balance, and in the purchases journal, enter the accounts payable ledger account number under the column total. I know you can read, and then it's almost rinse and repeat, right? <laughs> repeat the, uh, the steps for the purchases debit and the freight and debit. We're going to see this live in, in your homework example. So why are we even fooling with a purchases journal? Um, because we could do the same thing and post the exact we could put everything into the general ledger, the general journal, and post from the general journal, just like we did in account, Accounting 101. But well, what's the advantages of using these purchases journal? I think we had the conversation earlier, but it also allows for division of accounting work amongst the different employees. It strengthens the audit trail and weakens your ability to have human error. It records all credit purchases in one place. So now we're going to deal with accounts payable. So we're going to post the credit purchases from the purchases journal to the accounts payable subsidiary ledger, just like we did to the accounts receivable ledger last week. And we have, last week we had sales returns and allowances. Well, guess what? If we don't like what we purchase, we can return them and have a returns and allowances on purchases also. So we're going to record those into the general journal and post them to the accounts payable subsidiary ledger. And then just like last week in the homework, we had a schedule of accounts receivable. This week we're going to have a schedule of accounts payable showing exactly the total amount of how much we owe to each one of our vendors and the total of that schedule has to equal your general ledger account and then compute the net delivered cost of purchases <coughs> okay so now we we already posted the subtotals the totals we already posted to the ledger and I know so because the account numbers are underneath them. That tells me that they've been posted. Now we have to deal with the details. We're going to take the, the date and actually put the date here because this is International Sportsman. We purchased $600 from them, $550 for purchases and $50 for freight, but we owe them $600. This is the International Sportsman Accounts Payable Ledger. 
So International Sportsman, this is their actual ledger page for accounts payable for their own account uh, in your accounting system. So we bring down the date, we bring down the invoice number, and the date, the invoice date. I would probably have put this as 122.13 and one, instead of 123.13. And purchases journal begins with a P. Page one is where this $600 resides. So for cross references purposes, we have to put P1 in the posting reference. And we're going to credit accounts payable, which this is the International Sportsman Accounts Payable. This is their transaction. We're going to credit their account by $600. So their beginning balance before this transaction was $1,600. Credit. We now have added $600 credit to there. So now their balance is $2,200 credit. And I'm going to continue on, and I'm going to still invite people to pop in if they have questions throughout my process here. Um, now we have a purchase return. Somehow we didn't like it. Uh, a purchase return is a return on unsatisfactory goods previously purchased for resale. We didn't like the color. The um, we ordered turquoise and it came navy blue. Uh, our customers want turquoise. It's the turquoise city. I don't know. Uh, turquoise is the hot color of the season, not navy blue. We ordered turquoise. I have it on my purchase order. Turquoise. I opened the box and it was navy blue. That's a return of unsatisfactory goods. Or the, the quality of the goods is substandard because all the shirts had uh were falling apart at the seams your cost if, if we sold that to our customer our customers would be mad at us and we would have a lot of returns sorry i didn't like the color so posting how do we do that uh we, we're going to post hmm hold on I thought there was an example here. Well, there's an example in your homework. Keep with me a second. Okay, so you're going to see this in your homework exactly that we're going to go over in a couple minutes. So posting from the general journal. Here's your general journal. Um, accounts payable. Oh, this is a, this is the actual, actual purchase returns and allowances journal entry because the returns and allowances have to be journalized in the general journal because there's no specialized journal for to capture that information. So you have to put it to the general journal just like you put uh, used in accounting 101. So you're going to say, okay, accounts payable to international sportsmen. I'm going to debit $100 because the product was inferior. I'm returning it. So I'm debiting accounts payable, reducing the amount that I have to pay them. And I'm going to credit an account called Purchase Returns and Allowances. I'm going to credit that by 100 You remember when we first did a purchase, we, purch we debited purchases and we debited purchase uh, freight in. So if we debited purchases to receive it, we're going to credit purchases, returns, and allowances to reduce the amount and capture the reduction of our net purchases. So here, International Sportsman, we're coming down here to their accounts payable, specific accounts payable account. We had the balance of 1600 We added 600 because we purchased it. And then the next line would be a debit. This $100 would be debited here, reducing the amount. So now we have $2,100 to be paid 
that we owe to International Sportsman because we returned a hundred dollars of this six hundred dollar purchase this credit of I'm sorry this debit to accounts payable this is the accounts payable account to International Sportsman that debit would go right here because a debit reduces a credit balance account the uh, balance would now be twenty one hundred dollars So at the end of your process, you're going to uh, prepare a schedule of accounts payable. And that's simply putting a heading on it and writing down the names of everyone you owe, all the companies you owe, and how much at the end of the month you owe them. And that totals $20,245. Your accounts payable account, remember we had a beginning balance, then we had a, uh, a journal entry for the, uh, for the sales returns, uh, the purchase returns and allowance. We debited accounts payable by $100, and then we, but we credited from the purchases journal, we credited all of our purchases for the entire month, which was eighteen thousand seven ninety five. So eight ten thousand eight hundred minus a debit will get you a credit balance of ten thousand seven hundred plus an additional credit of eighteen thousand seven ninety five increases the balance up to twenty nine thousand four ninety five. The four twenty thousand twenty nine thousand four ninety five credit balance minus a payment you paid off $9,250. This will be the cash payment journal, which we will go into next week. So we paid down our accounts payable by $9,250. So now we owe $20,245. This balance in this account has to equal the sum of the detail by company, by vendor. This, the total here, 20245 has to equal the total here. If it doesn't, you have to find it. You can't fudge it. Yes, it needs to be circled. Okay, so what is the net delivered cost of purchases for our sporting goods company? Well, it's our purchases plus our freight in. And that's the 18795 That's the number we've been working with throughout this entire lecture minus our purchase returns and allowances of a hundred dollars so our net delivered cost of purchases is eighteen thousand six ninety five and I believe that's the end or that's soon to be the end uh, effective systems have the following controls in place you know we always talk about controls in our discussion forums well, here, all purchases should be made only after proper authorization has been given in writing. Goods should be carefully checked when received. They should then be compared with the purchase order and with the invoice received from the supplier. The purchase order receiving report and invoice should be checked to confirm that the information reflected on all of those documents are in agreement. And then computations on the invoice should be checked for accuracy. You'd be amazed. Sometimes I've seen invoices from companies uh, with my clients that they got they were they receive invoices that have addition errors to them. Uh, and the authorization for payment should be made by someone other than the person who ordered the goods. And that authorization should be given only after everything's been verified. And someone else should write the check. Pre-numbered forms should be used for the purchase requisition, purchase orders, and checks. And ever so often, the numbers of the documents issued should be verified to make sure that all the forms can be accounted for. So now we're experts in accounts payable and purchases journal. Now I'm sure your question is, what about my homework? So let's go to the homework and let's see how it looks to you initially have I put you ladies to sleep yet 
Uh-oh. No, not yet. Uh-oh. You got me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a cool part. What do we have to do for our homework? Week three assignment. My gosh, it's already week three. Can you imagine that? Okay, we have a new computer sales promotion. Hopes to bring in more cash customers to your store for February. And we have this template, so I'm going to just click on the template, pull it down. There it goes. And let's see what other information we have. We recognize the importance of property tracking receivables. You also recognize the need to create an accounts payable subsidiary ledger. And we deal with two vendors, Elite Computing and Simon Supply. And then they've given us some transactions. We purchase merchandise, purchase merchandise, purchase merchandise, purchase supplies, and we return some merchandise purchased. So that's our future right here. And you're supposed to basically work with the uh, template to make sure that each transaction is appropriately in the journal and make necessary posts. So let's let's just look at the um, what we have to work with here. Okay, this is what I just downloaded. And you see we have the purchases journal which we discussed earlier today and then we have the one general the general journal which has two transactions in it from the ex, from the um, the problem and that's under the journals tab under the the ledgers we have the general ledger for the appropriate accounts for we don't have a complete general ledger but we have supplies and accounts payable and purchases Freight in, purchase returns, and allowances. So that's the general ledger accounts that we're dealing with. Accounts payable. And then we move over to the accounts payable ledger. And this is Elite Computing, one company we're buying a merchandise from. And we owe money to, right now, at the beginning of this process, we owe him $5,500. And we have Simon with Simon Supplies. And we will owe him some transactions. And here we go with we owe him thirteen hundred before we start this transaction. Then let's just go down. And here's the schedule of accounts payable, which will be where we list off and have a total. And does this total equal to the general ledger? So this total right there, this total right here, should equal. Accounts payable, this number right here. Those two should equal. So let's see what it looks like because uh, I kind of uh, took the, the uh, solution, but I put different numbers in. So this is what the solution will look like, but you'll have different numbers. So you just can't pull exactly what I have here because all the numbers are different but I think it's a good way to see how it flows. In the purchases journal, you'll have three transactions. And you notice that every yellow space is pretty much filled in. So you have three transactions where you purchased merchandise. Here's your invoice numbers, here's the invoice dates, and here's the terms. Net 90. Oh my gosh, Elite Computing doesn't need their money for 90 days. That's three months of free financing. That's awesome. So net 30, net 30. And then we have purchases debit, 4,000. There's no freight in. And so we owe them 4,000. Here we have for Elite Computing, 4,000 purchases because we had to pay freight of 200. So we owe Elite Computing 4200 And here's our totals. And here we have two journal entries. One journal entry uh, for purchasing supplies. Remember, the purchases journal is to buy 
purchases of merchandise for resale. One of our purchases, though, is for supplies. So we had to do that in the general ledger. I'm, I'm sorry, in the general journal, because this is not merchandise for resale. It's office supplies for the office. So um, it's supplies. And here we have of the 550 that we purchased from Simon, we return 200. So we have a purchase returns and allowances. So after we get the initial data posted into the purchases journal and the general journal, how does this flow into the ledgers? Well, I kind of color coded things. So let's first go with the purple. We have two general journals journal entries, one for supplies, and one for $200 for uh, returns. So let's go to ledger. And you don't have to put color coding on your homework. I'm doing this so you see it easier. So here we have supplies by 50 debit, and we owe Simon supplies by 50 credit. Likewise, this is just accounting 101, right? Where we go from the general journal to the general ledger. And here we go to purchase returns and allowances, 200 credit. And the debit will be against accounts payable here. Now, I want to, at this point, give a reminder on how debits and credits work. Accounts payable has a normal credit balance, so you would expect this to be a credit. A credit plus an additional credit of 550 will get you a larger credit. So 7350 credit plus a debit of 200, we reduce the balance by $200 to 7150. 7150 credit plus an additional credit of 9,775 would get you a larger credit as a balance. So uh, these always work this way. Um, so now that's the purple. Let's go back to the journal and let's take the, the dark, the darker purple, the bluish purple. And these are the totals in the purchases journal. So this is the total for uh, debits to purchases 9500 freight in 275 and accounts payable of the total is 9775 so let's find the purple here in the general ledger here's a 9775 for accounts payable credit now we have two debits one would be the 9500 for purchases and the freight in would be the 2000 the 275 dollars so these are the sub these are the totals of all those transactions from the journal page. It's posting this detail into the general ledger accounts. 9500 plus 275 debits equals 9775 credit. And they're to the correct accounts. So at this point, we're good on the general ledger and therefore on our way to doing the financial statements. However, we are missing one level of detail is how much do we owe each of our vendors? So this level of detail still needs to be posted somewhere. So elite computing, we had two transactions for 4,000 and 4,200 and Simon's we had transactions of 1575. And I'm going to go over here to the accounts payable subsidiary ledger. And this is elite computing. And here's 4,000 and 4,200. And here's a 1575 transaction that we now owe in addition to Simon Supply. And just like before, these are running balances. And here, 5,500 credit plus a 4,000 credit. Is 9,500 credit plus 4,200 credit gets you 13,700. But here we have 1,300 credit plus 1,575 gets you a larger credit. 
plus 550 credit gets you a larger credit. Minus 200 debit will get you 3225. The difference between these two lines is your debit. So on accounts payable, if it has a credit balance, because accounts payable should have a credit balance, credit additions to that balance should increase the balance and debit should decrease the balance. Just the opposite with debit balances. And then we come down here and say, remember the 13700 and the 3225? Well, we have Elite Computing and we write 13700 plus Simon Supplies, 3225, and we add those together to get 16925. And does this equal accounts payable ledger balance of 16925? I think in this case it does. So we captured everything and everything was in its right place. From the two who's on right now, are there any questions? Uh, no, I don't have any. Okay, great. So uh, do we have the other lady on too? I don't have any questions. Everything's good and clear? I think so. Excellent. Well, you remember the support that you have throughout this next week. Because we only have one more week, and that's, that's the end of this class. So you, you have, you've come a long way since seven weeks ago, haven't you all? Oh, yes. <laughs> and accounting is the language of business. Can you, can you kind of pick that up? Because we're talking income statement. We're talking sales and cost of sales and purchases. These are all terminology that you will use and probably do use in business right now. And even in your personal life, you go into Walmart and you purchase something or you return something. Those are business terms. That's kind of cool to realize. Yeah, if, if we think like that, it would be easier to remember the terminology and how to apply it. Exactly, because every time you spend your money you're not spending your money with another individual you're spending your money with another business so you can start thinking about oh i'm buying something from mcdonald's today mcdonald's is receiving my cash that's their cash debit that's their sales credit but to give me my hamburger, they had to purchase meat and buns and ketchup. So you can start looking at every place that you actually go into as a business case. And, and it'll, it'll make more sense to you, I think. Yeah, because uh, that'll help me think, remember what's debit and what's credit. Because I still get kind of mixed up sometimes with that. And, and thinking like that will help me. Exactly. in my head. Just don't do it for the bank. No. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let me tell you, the bank, I think, that messes up a lot of uh, new accounting students. Because you put your cash in the bank, right? Right. And we're telling you that increase in account would be a debit to cash and a credit to wages, wages uh, revenue. But then you get the bank statement, and they have your deposit down as a credit. We're telling you that increasing your cash is a debit. But let's flip this. They are the bank. When you put money into the, the bank, they now have a liability to you to pay you the cash. So. When you receive a bank statement from the bank, that's their liability account that they're sending you details on. It's your asset account, but it's their liability account because it's your money they're holding.
That makes sense. Okay, it does. So just let that settle in. And as a liability, when you put money into the bank, they would credit their liability account. When you take money out, that would be a debit to the account, hence the term debit card. And if you have bank service fees or any such things that would reduce the balance of your bank statement, then those would be debit. So we've been trained by the banks unknowingly that debits are bad, credits are good, and that money gets increased with credits. It's really the liability because that's in their ledger that your account sits. So think through that for next week. And if you have questions, let me know. I'd be glad to get, because I think that's a major source of why people have debits and credit issues or confusions is because they look at their bank, as bank statements and we've been conditioned all our lives on how a liability account is, but it's our cash account. Did I help or hinder? No, it's making more sense for me. Good, good. <laughs> well, it's 13 after, and um, is there any other questions? No, not on the um, homework. I know on the assessment I have uh, a problem. I'm trying to figure it out on my own again, but if I still can't figure out how to to you know look at it uh, I'll contact you oh that's that's not a problem and if I'm if I I teach other places and sometimes I'm not available but contact me and if not go directly to the other two sources for live help yeah okay all right thanks and I'll, and I'll be glad to help you if I'm if I can get to the phone okay well I'll probably go to one of the other sessions and bring it bring it up there so we could go through it step by step Excellent. Okay, great. Well, you take care, and I'll see you next week. Okay, okay. thank you so much. Okay, bye. 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 Thank bye. you. Okay, you're welcome. Are you good, too? Yes. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.